Okay, so for the rest of today, I want to round off the course um, by completing the circle and going back to the idea of set theory as a foundation for mathematics. And also, in doing so, I want to address um, an important aspect of set theory that has been quite neglected in the course so far, and this is set theory as a formal axiomatic theory. We've been dealing with it as an informal axiomatic theory. We've had axioms for, for working with sets that we've treated as axioms in any other subject of mathematics. So axioms we work with using our, order, our everyday informal mathematics. But um, set theory as often presented, and as it really is deep down, is a purely formal mathematical theory um, where the proofs are formal proofs that follow precise rules. And the whole and the aspect of this that's important for mathematics, or one aspect that's important for mathematics, is that set theory is a purely formal axiomatic theory, which is has the remarkable property that is sufficiently powerful that pretty much all of established mathematics can be proved, can be translated as statements of set theory and proved statements of set theory. So today I want to talk about this uh, in as much as we can do in one lecture, and I also don't want it to be a long lecture today. So, um, so we're going to talk about formal axiomatic set theory. Um, and foundations. The foundations of mathematics. Just in case you're only in it for the credit and not for the interest value, and you so in case you might want to walk out straight away. Um, so none of the, today's material is examinable. So the whole day is because we can't really can't really cover anything in sufficient detail to do it to be able to ask exam questions. On it. So you're very welcome in the first break or even before if you want to to walk out of the room. Um, So the first thing I want to do is begin by showing how the axioms that we covered in the, in the first lecture when we presented axioms for sets and classes can be made purely formal, that is written essentially as strings of symbols in a precise delimited language. Delimited means constrained to fit into some rules that can't be extend you know, a language that's precisely specified. Um, so, we're, so we're going to reformulate our axioms. I mean, that's the same axioms, but we're just going to express them in a precise language. And the precise language we use is the language of logic and particularly the kind of logic called first order logic. So we, we can formulate our axioms, or let's not say can because we will. So we formulate our axioms And you don't need, some of you I know have done a logic course, but you don't need, well, not just, not just the logic in logics from the first year, but from the first year undergraduate, but also master's logic course, some people have done. You don't need to have done that to um, understand what's going to follow. I'm going to do enough from, from scratch, from the beginning. So we're going to formulate our axioms in first order logic. The basic idea here is we give ourselves a language for expressing properties. So properties being statements that are either true or false. So for example, our axioms are going to be statements that we have that we assert as being true statements. So the sort of thing we're going to need to express are the sorts of properties that we have in our axioms 
such as we would want to have a language that's sufficiently rich to say, express the power set axiom, saying that at any set there exists a, another set that consists in exactly of the collection of all subsets of the first set. So the language needs to be rich enough to express that. Um, oh, wrong one. So the properties are expressed by things called formulas. And the beauty of first order logic, particularly the set theory, is that it's very, very easy to say what a formula is. So, so formulas, important notion, uh, strings of symbols, given according to precise rules that we can use for asserting properties. And in particular, we're going to be looking at a specific language for expressing such properties, which is a language that's appropriate for talking about um, elements of the universe and which elements are sets, and the crucial notion of an element of the universe belonging to a set. So the formulas are constructed from variables. using variables, let's say using rather than from, I'm going to have an unlimited supply of variable names, but I'm going to use standard letters, variables like X, Y, and Z. And we think of these variables as ranging over elements of the universe. So that's just a way of thinking. So I'll put that in blue, it's not part. When we're defining the language, it's irrelevant how we think about things. The language is just the rules for, for, for saying what a formula is. Um, but it's useful to know how to think about things so we can understand what we're doing. So ranging over variables, avoiding over elements of the universe. That's the intuition. And we simply have a few ways of constructing such formulas. So the bullet point, I mean, this is like a PowerPoint list of things. So, so these are different ways of constructing formulas. So we're allowed to have a, the formula expressing the equality of two things. So this says element X of the universe equals element Y of the universe. We're going to have a formula I'm going to write S of X. And this expresses the property that element X of the universe is a set. For the element that the variable X is standing for is a set, so X is a set. Something that's not a set. And we're going to have a formula X belongs to Y. It says that the element X is a member of the set, the set Y. So, it's a, so this is saying, in a sense, Y is a set and X is a member of, of Y. Um, so these are what are called atomic formulas. These are the basic building blocks of the formulas. And then we are allowed to combine these using the logical connectives. So such as and or implication, by implication, if and only if, and negation. So, so we'll have, um, so if we've got two, if we've got two formulas, phi and psi, we can form the conjunction, phi and psi, on the disjunctions, I'm just going to put all these things in a single row. Disjunction phi or psi. Um, the negation, not phi, phi is not true. This would be enough because we're going to have classical logic. This is, in, in fact, we could just have and and negation or or and negation. 
um, everything else is definable from that. This is probably stuff we did in Logica and Moje said. Um, but anyway, let's have, make the language as rich. It's useful to have simple ways of saying things. So, so we'll give ourselves phi implies psi. People sometimes write a double arrow by if and only if psi. So these are the basic ways of combining formulas using the Boolean connectives, operations on truth values. And then the particular aspect of first order logic is that first order logic allows you to also quantify over variables. So we can quantify over things in the universe. So we're also going to have quantified formulas for all x phi. So phi is here a formula that may or may not contain the variable x. If it doesn't contain the variable x, the quantification is actually not doing anything interesting. But it's typically it will contain the formula x, and we're saying that the property phi holds for all x in the universe. And that there are the two main quantifiers also. So phi holds for all x in the universe, and there exists some x in the universe such that phi holds. And these are all the rules for forming formulas. So basically, we start off with these three ways of building atomic formulas, and we combine them using the um, Boolean connectives, as they're called, and the quantifiers. Okay, and remarkably with that, we can express all the properties basically we've expressed on this course in this language. That's an amazing thing, but um, justifying that would really take doing the whole course again in this formal language, which of course I'm not going to do, but you can just um, you could read a book on formal set theory if you want, and you will find that other people have essentially done that. Um, So the amazing thing, let me move the camera. Um, the amazing thing is that using this very precise and carefully um, regulated notation, the axiom of the set theory can expre be expressed very neatly and concisely. Although it's a little bit tedious to write things out just using these constructions and only these constructions. So I, wa I actually want to write out our axioms formally for you so that you can see how easily it can be done. But to do that conveniently, it's um, actually helpful to introduce some shorthands abbreviations to make things a little bit simpler. Um, so, so some convenient abbreviations. Abbreviation is a shorter way of writing something. So our basic universal quantification is saying for all x elements of the universe, so for all elements of the universe x, the property phi holds, or there exists an element of the universe x such that the property phi holds. It's quite often useful to be able to say for all x in some given set y phi holds, rather than for all x in the universe holds, for all x in the universe holds. So we'll give ourselves a notation for that. So, for, so we want to be able to say for all x in y, by holes. And that's easy to express using what we've got, but it's nice to be able to write it down more briefly like, like this. This is simply for all x, if x belongs to y, then by holes. Similarly, another abbrevi related abbreviation. We don't want to say that there exists some x in the universe such that phi holds, but there exists some x within the set phi that we already know about or know some properties of phi holds. Then the one. It's nice to be able to say that using this concise notation, but what we mean when we do, we can write that out as a 
longer formula saying there exists a, so there are n, so now there exists an x such that that x belongs to y. The appropriate connective to put here is an and and by elements. Okay, so those two are rather easy and very standard. Something that's less standard is the following that I learned about from I first encountered in the works of a logician called Peter Axel. I'm going to introduce another quantifier. So backwards S, that's what that's supposed to be, X phi. So like a for all is an upside down A for all, but A for all, and exists is a back to front E for exists. So this is a, a backwards S or a mirror reflection, a mirror image of an S for, there are set many X such that phi holds. So remember, we have this distinction between sets and classes. We, we state a property. We've got the collection of all X that satisfy a property in our unit, the collection of all X in the universe that satisfy a property. In general, that might be a proper class. It might be, in general, that's a class because it's a subcollection of the universe. Um, but if we can gather all the X's that satisfy in the universe that satisfy phi, if they form, if we can gather them together in a set, then we can say there are set many x that satisfy phi. So this quantifier is expressing that property. So somehow classes are very big, whereas sets are small, although they can be quite large because they can be, we've seen, we've encountered lots of rather large and mind-boggling sets in this course. So to say there are set many x that satisfy phi, we want to say that there exists a set y so there exists a y such that y is a set. We've got our basic formula for expressing that y is a set. And for all x, this set y consists exactly of those elements x that satisfy phi. So for all x, x belongs to y if and only if phi. Okay, and it's important when we write this. Phi, the formula of phi is a string of symbols according to these rules. It will mention some variables. It's important that we choose a variable y here that is not um, that is not a variable that appears in the formula of phi. Otherwise, this would go wrong. But we can always do that. When we say it exists a y, it's irrelevant if we call it y or z, we're just saying there exists something. But in order for this formula to work, we need to make sure that we, we call it by a name that does not conflict with something that we're already talking about in phi. So choose y here, choose y such that um, y. So the precise technical term, the thing you need to do is ensure that y does not appear in what are called the free variables of the formula phi. Um, but it's enough to choose a y that does not appear in phi. That's, I mean, that's just for people who know a little bit more about logic to be a bit more precise there. Um, but anyway, this is a nice convenient notation for saying um, there are set many x that belong to phi. So it doesn't generalize the, ex the existence because if there are no x that satisfy phi, then there is then that means the set of all x is that the collection of all x's that satisfy phi is empty. And of course, that is a set. So in the great case that there are no x that satisfy phi, that will be one instance in which there are indeed set many x that satisfy phi, because the empty, the empty collection is a set. We have the empty set as a set. Anyway, given that notation, we can now state very concisely all the axioms, uh, well, axioms for the axiomatic theory presented in lecture one.
Let's move the camera. So a complete formal anti-metrization of the set theory I've been using in the course fits on one board. So I'm first going to state an axiom called membership whose sole role is to clarify the status of the, the interrelationship between the predicate, as it's called, that asserts the text is a set, and the other predicate expressing the relation that expresses that an element X is a member of another set of a set Y. And this, this, mem this, this axiom, which I call membership, or mem short membership, says that if y belongs to x, then x is a set. So the membership relation is constrained to only refer to sets on the right. And when you write this axiom, really we're saying for all x and for all y in the universe, if y belongs to x, then x is a set. So that's the the nicest way of stating the axiom of the universal quantifiers on the front. But against all the axioms I'm going to state have universal quantifiers on the front for the variables that do not appear within quantifiers in the axioms themselves. And it gets tedious to write down these universal quantifiers. So on the future axioms, I'm going to miss out the universal quantifiers on the front. Isn't why is that? Thank you. No, no. Uh, so if y belongs to x, we could have a set of natural numbers. We're not so in our axioms, this is not yet some other Frankel set theory where everything is a set. This is the axioms that we've been using throughout the course where we do not assume that the universe consists only of sets. But ordinals are not a set. So we, we do not assume that ordinals are on sets, but we could engineer them to be sets. We could use the von Neumann ordinals for our ordinals. The von Neumann ordinals are sets because that's how we define them. Yeah, but the set of all ordinals is not a set. So the set, well, yeah, the collection of all, the class of all yeah, ordinals yeah. is not a set. Yeah, but it's so the set, so. Sorry? It does contain sets, or it does contain elements which are part of it, part of it. Because it contains elements as a set. It is. I mean, it is oh, I see. Point. Ah, I see what you mean. Right. So this is a good point. Yeah. Okay. I was misunderstanding your, your question first. So, so indeed, the way I have been using membership in the in the course, and this is actually an excellent point, and I haven't realised what you're getting. So, in the course, I've been using membership to be. I'm, I've been. I've been allowing us to say things like this, where x where X is a class. And, and that's fine. We started off with classes and, and, with, and with this notation. Um, so that's, that's completely fine. Actually, the way a class will be expressed in our first order language is a class is going to be expressed as some formula containing the free variable containing some free variable x and it's stating all the x that belong to this property that, that satisfy this property so so for example the class of all the class of all elements of the universe the whole universe would be x equals x the class of all sets that are not members of themselves would be x would be the, the, those things satisfying that such that x is a set and x and it's not true that X belongs to X. So this is, so we express classes using formulas. And then, so, so we think of this as expressing a class, and then the statement X belongs to that class is just expressed by the formula itself. And the statement Z belongs to that class is expressed by the formula, the same formula, but we change the variable X to, to Z. So, so statements about classes, 
can be translated to our formal language, but we're not going to translate the membership relation about classes to the membership relation in the formula, formal language. It's going to be translated just to formulas stating properties. This me the membership relation in our formal language is a relation between elements of the universe. Classes are not elements of the universe. The elements of the universe are any entities we start with, like numbers and things like that, together with sets. Remember, we defined a set to be a collection that is an element of the universe. So this relation is just by the requirements of first order logic, you can, the, a relation is just expressing properties between things in the universe. That's, that's how first order logic works. So this membership relation is only talking about a relation between things in the universe. So given to think a pair of things in the universe, we do not want to talk about one element of the universe being a member of another element of the universe when the other element of the universe is not a set. We don't want to talk about what it means for Y to be an element of a natural number, for example. So that's this axiom. So that was a rather long answer, but I think I've now addressed the question, but it was a very good question. So thanks for asking that, because I hadn't even considered that um, sort of the possibility of being, of, uh, well, the, the, the ambiguity here about this notation. Good. So the membership is stating the interrelation between being a set and the membership relation. Um, and we've got an important axiom called extensionality, which tells us when two sets are equal. And that's if, so if X is a set, so again, it's for all X and for all Y, if X is a set and Y is a set, and for all Z in the universe, Z belongs to X if and only if Z belongs to Y, then if all, the, if all these conjoined, joined together by an AND formulas are true, then X equals Y. It also, we also want the other implication that if X equals Y, then they have the same members, but that follows from the rules of first order logic because the rules of logic say, if two things are equal, they have the same properties. Um, so I shall rub off this red part now. And I left a bit too much space there because I was going to, I did want to squeeze the axioms onto one board, um, but I shall just squeeze things up a bit now. So then we have the separation axiom. So these, these axioms are all ones that, apart from the membership, which is just about how we use the language, so to speak, the rest of the axioms are all ones we've stated um, informally already in the, in the first lecture. So the separation axiom, remember it said, for any class, if we've got, if we've got a set, then the elements of the set that belong to any given class also form a set. So we can restrict the set to elements that belong to a given class. So, then, so again, we're going to see how we deal with classes in our language here. So if X is a set, then, then what we want to say is a collection of all elements Y, such that Y is an element that, of all those elements Y belonging to X, that belong to a class. So we're going to use a formula phi to express the class. Um, so, what, so for any formula phi, what we want is the collection of all X, of all Y, collection of all Y belonging to X, such that phi holds of y, some property phi holds of y, this forms a set. So for any property of elements, um, if we restrict the set x to the y satisfying that property, we still get a set back. And we can say this nice and neatly using our set quantifier. I mean, it wouldn't take much. If we didn't want to use a set quantifier, we would need to write it out like like this, we need to expand it like this. But there are, so for any set X and any property of elements, if we consider the elements of the set that satisfy the property, there are only set, 
Now, the collection of all such elements forms a set. Pairing Um, so this says that if you've got two elements X and Y, then there is, then, then the doubleton set that contains just the elements X and Y belongs, sorry, is well, the doubleton collection class that contains just the elements X and Y is a set. So again, we can say for any X and Y, if we consider what well, the doubleton element is, we consider the collection of all Z such that either z equals x or z equals y. So there are only two elements z that satisfy this disjunction. We want to say that forms a set. So again, we use the set many quantifier to say that. So this is saying the pair set, the, the unordered pair that contains just the two elements x and y is again a set. Um, the power set axiom, is saying that if X is a set, then the collection of all subsets of X forms a set. So once again, we want to say for any set X, well, we're going to have the formula that says there are only set many subsets of X. So there are set many Y. So what is it to be a subset of X? Well, Y needs to be a set. So Y is a set. And it needs to satisfy the property that all its members, all the members of Y are members of X. So for all Z in Y, Z belongs to X. Now, in the axioms I gave you, um, we had replacement, which is if we have a set, and a function and a class function from a set into a class, then its image is a set. And we had the union axiom that if we have any set of sets, then the union of that set of sets is again a set. In fact, these can be combined together in an axiom that's rather simple, rather easier to write down, called the indexed union axiom. So I'm going to so, so just because it's possible to do this, and this is a, neat, a neater formulation, I'm going to write it in this way, rather than transliterating those two axioms. The, I mean, one can transliterate the replacement axiom and the union axiom, um, but this is just a, a shorter way of getting the combination of the two. So the index union axiom says that if we have a set X, then And it holds that for all y in x, sorry, this should be a conjunction here, if, but there's going to be an implication later on. So it's if we have a set x, and for all y in x, uh, there are set many z such that phi hold, then, so the idea here is that we've got an index set x, and for each element y of the index set, phi is stating a property of element z and it's giving us a set of elements so to every y in the index set we're assigning the set of elements of all those z that satisfy phi and the index union axiom is going to say the u the indexed union over all y and x the unions of all those collections of z's is going to be a set so actually we can say that so this is actually a good one to think about in your own time after the lecture to understand i mean i've explained it informally now so i'm just going to, i've explained it informally already so i'm going to write it down in symbols so you need to say there are set many z that belong to that union so belonging to the union so z belongs to the union if there exists an index element such that z is an element of the set indexed by that index element so so there are set many z for which there exists an index element y such that z satisfies that property, that phi property that says it belongs to that. So the point is here, which I've already said, this is equivalent to um, replacement plus union. 
axioms from lecture two. But the nice thing about it is that we can get the power of the replacement axiom without having to bother to talk about class functions. So that's why it's nicer to formulate things and we don't need to formulate class functions. And lastly, apart from the axiom of choice, which I'm not going to write down, we've got the infinity axiom. And I think the easiest way to write down the infinity axiom, the shortest way, and the, well, maybe not the short, a convenient way to write down the axiom in the language we've got is, oh my God. Um, <laughs> Let's get back to my own doing it. So, we want to say there exists an infinite set. So, there exists an X. We don't need to say it's a set because that's going to be implied by the next statement. So, there exists some Y in X. So, it so X is necessarily a set because it's got some element such that Y is a set. And for all Z, it's not true that Z belongs to Y. Okay, so, so this is just saying X contains the empty set, only we don't yet have an axiom that tells us that the empty set is a set. So, so this is part of this is telling us that the empty set is a set and it belongs to. Um, so there exists a set Y that is the empty set, and moreover, it belongs to X. Okay, it's not too bad. And then we're going to say it contains the empty set, and it's closed under the von Neumann oper successor operation for every element in the set. The element union itself is um, the von Neumann successor. The element union itself also belongs to the set. So for all, so and, for all y and x, we want the von Neumann successor to belong to x. But again, we need to define what the von Neumann successor is. So we're going to say there exists a z in x, and we're going to state the property that z is the von Neumann successor of x. So for z to be the von Neumann successor, that means that every w in z is either, um, well, so Z is the von Neumann successor of X, so it's X union the singleton X. So every element of Z either needs to be an element of X or it needs to be X itself. That's stating that it's the von Neumann successor. So we want to say for all um, W, W belongs to Z, but the von Neumann successor consists precisely of those Ws belonging to Z. Sorry. So, so if I it consists precisely of the elements of X, so either W belongs to X or W equals X. Right. We want Z to consist precisely of either the elements of X or X itself. Um, sorry, hang on. There should be, if we're all Y in X, so just a Z in X. So this should be we want the von Neumann successor of, of Y here. Right. Anyway, and yeah, there we go. So those are the so those are the axioms that we've been using throughout the course, apart from the axiom of choice. So we'll add those I'm not going to formulate. So plus AC or one of its variants. Okay. Um, right. So it's five past three. Um, does anyone want this to be a 15 minute break? No? Okay. Um, in that case, it will be a 10-minute break, and we'll start again at quarter past three.